as everyone is, is loading in, I will say good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon session, Digital World, A Decade of BIM. Um, I'm Dan, uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce myself properly in a minute and what we'll first do is go through a little bit of housekeeping, go through the order of the day so that we understand what's happening for today's session uh, as we proceed to move forward. Uh, so I guess the first thing first is let's go through a little bit of housekeeping if you don't mind. Fantastic, thank you. Um, hopefully you've been to several of our webinars in the past. If you have, then these are very similar sort of rules that we're running today. Uh, if not, please be aware of some of the things I'm about to go through now. Uh, the first is that today is a listen-only webinar that has been recorded. Uh, there are two useful aspects to that. Uh, the first is that the, the fact that it's been recorded means that we're going to also place it on our on-demand platform, which means that if you're having to leave later or you want to share some of the insights from today with any friends or colleagues, uh, you should be able to do so afterwards, which is fab. And the other is that because it's a listen-only webinar, um, there are various different ways that you can interact with us uh, because we won't be able to take you off mute for you to join in. Um, what you can do is engage with us via the Q&A function on the webinar itself. If you look at the panel on the right-hand side, you have the ability to ask questions. Um, in there, you can probably ask two types of questions. If you're having any technical issues, for example, the sound goes out, if you can't see something that people are describing on the screen, that sort of thing, then please put those questions in and a member of our team will investigate, come back to you or let us know as we are uh, presenting the webinar itself. Uh, the other one will be that we'll be having a discussion panel session after the first two sessions. Uh, and so we'd like to hear your questions, your views and thoughts that you want to have. So if you populate your questions in as we go through the session, we can ask those questions to the panel um, as we go forward to make today as interactive as possible. In addition, uh, after the first comfort break, we'll be using Miro to gain feedback on ISO 19650. So if you're staying for the feedback session there, uh, please uh, stick along. The link will appear after Dana Churcher kindly gives the instructions of how the day is going to go. We'll provide the link, people can jump on the board. Uh, and start providing some feedback to us, which helps build in the, the UK view of how we should proceed going forwards. Uh, as mentioned, any technical difficulties, check them in the Q&A. Uh, and as always, with any of our BSI events, uh, after the event itself, you'll receive an email asking you to complete the feedback survey. If you do complete the feedback survey, you'll, you'll be able to get access to a CPD certificate, so you can register this as professional development as well as then access the recording afterwards as well. So those feedbacks are very valuable for us to help make our events better and also provide you access to things like a CPD certificate and those links there too. Uh, so all in all, useful for everyone. So I think really from a housekeeping point of view, that is probably more than enough there. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll introduce myself properly. Um, so I'm Dan Rosser one of the built environment sector leads here at BSI, the British Science Institution. Uh, and just to give you a small kind of snapshot as to why this event has come about, uh, and it's come through the realization of when a colleague spoke to me uh, and mentioned that it's been 10 years since Paz 1192 part two was published. And I think on hearing that fact, I immediately felt very old, uh, realizing that where, where, where's 10 years gone? Uh, and after a short spiral, uh, then started to think about actually about how much things have changed uh, and how lots of uh, new technology, new processes, and how sort of everything has kind of had an impact since then. So we thought that this would be quite a useful theme for today's event uh, going forwards. So which is exactly why we've set it up in this way. And if we have a brief look at the agenda, I'll explain some rationale in terms of what's going to be happening for today. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so uh, you can hear my semi-coherent rambling at the moment, which is the welcome and introduction. Uh, after that, um, we're going to look at the past, where Fergus is going to kindly go through um, the impact of what's been happening from uh, the last 10 years, uh, and his view as Deputy Director of the Department of Business and Trade, uh, which will be incredibly interesting. Uh, after that, 
Uh, Anne Kemp is joining us, Chair of NEMA and the Technical Director of Atkins, who's going to talk about some of the present aspects, you know, what is happening now and the current kind of zeitgeist around BIM and information management. Uh, and after that, uh, the three of us will have that discussion panel, which will be doing a bit of future gazing, looking at where we are going and the directions being taken uh, for BIM and information management over the next 10 years. And then after that, as mentioned, We'll have our breakout session where we'll be looking at Myro with both Dave Churcher and Anna Frecker will take us through collecting some feedback on ISO 19650 to help advise any future developments there going forwards. So hopefully you can see the logic of what we're presenting, how it's coming through, and we welcome your questions for feedback session as well as your feedback on 19650 when we get to that point later on today. And I think probably without further ado there, um, I will pass over to our first speaker. Uh, as mentioned, we've got Fergus Harridan, Deputy Director um, for Infrastructure and Construction at the Department of Business and Trade. I think Fergus, it is over to you, sir. Um, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Fergus Harridan, Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Construction, now in the Department of Business and Trade, until recently part of the Department of Business and Energy Industrial Strategy. And what I was going to uh, aim to do today is just take you relatively quickly, hopefully, through the history of BIM uh, and what it is that government has done with it over the last 20 years, but with a particular focus on the period since 2011, which is the point at which we announced the BIM mandate and 2016 and the introduction of that, and show you some of the, uh, the ways in which we have um, used the developing, uh, developed capability of BIM within government in order to support the better delivery of the projects and, and programmes that um, government uh, undertakes. So if I just uh, quickly move on with um, one of the slides. Sorry, there appears to be a little bit of a Problem moving this on. That's right, folks. If you try, if you try clicking in the middle of the screen. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Let's try. Let's try. And then try using the. Ah, uh, excellent. Great, thank you. Um, okay, trying to get this back on track. Uh, so the use of computer-aided design for buildings did actually originate in the 1950s. Uh, and it developed through the 1960s and, and 1970s, but it, it really only started to, to take off this century. And that began in, in with the, the development of BIM and the concept of different levels of BIM, starting with, with BIM level zero, BIM levels one, two, and two, three, all of which were characterized by a combination of a, a greater level of development of the technology and the technological capability, but also actually some of the, um, organizational factors around that. So for example, the, the level of collaboration between organizations within the supply chain and uh, collaboration between um, the client, the prime contractor and other firms and their ability to use BIM as a tool to overcome some of the traditional challenges that we've seen in the construction sector, particularly in relation to, to the sharing of accurate information, uh, agreeing designs, resolving conflicts and that kind of thing. So in 2007, um, that was when the BS 1192 standard was actually defined. And that, that was a huge step forward as far as government. And I think the private sector was concerned because you actually did have a defined standard that everyone could understand and be accredited to. And it was something that you could utilize and specify in contractual and other documentation or could form the basis of discussions with, with firms in the market if you're um, as part of a market sounding or supply chain engagement exercise and use this as a way of setting expectations about the level of capability and the, the quality of the output that we wanted to see in relation to the development of BIM. And the things I think that really uh, accelerated the development of BIM were government's desire to make construction more reliable in terms of cost and the schedule of delivery, but also our increasing focus on improving its sustainability and in particular reducing the level of carbon emissions linked to construction given that the built environment accounts for about 40% of all carbon emissions in the UK. And therefore, if you are going to decarbonize the UK economy, you have to address some of the challenges in the built environment. 
and particularly when it comes to new buildings and infrastructure that increasingly supplies to, to existing buildings as well, as well. BIM is a very, very powerful tool in giving you the capability to rapidly design and, and assess the likely um, impact of uh, various buildings or infrastructure uh, in relation to, to their sustainability and being able to reduce those carbon emissions. Um, then in 2011, this was the first time that government did actually formally adopt BIM as a requirement for the delivery uh, of uh, government construction product projects. When we announced in, that we would be introducing the BIM mandate, um, which came into full effect in 2016, the five year period that was really preparatory phase, but we signaled our intention clearly to the market by saying, this is what we wanted to do now, but we would absolutely insist upon it by the time that we reached um, 2016. And what had happened over the, the, the subsequent years, starting in 2015, where the, the PAS 11922 standard was developed, is that we've worked with the BSI, we've worked with other organisations in the industry to try and ensure that the UK is at the forefront of BIM development. And it's, it's not just um, in relation to um, BIM, the development of BIM technologies, it's in relation to the development of some of the, the, the wider organisation processes and approach. So, uh, as you can see, the, um, there was a, a, a number of iterations of the, the, the uh, PAS uh, 1192 standard, the development of the, the uh, BIS 90, sorry, the, the BS 1192 standard as well. Um, and ultimately that led to uh, the UK engaging um, very successfully in, with the International Standards Organization um, and securing the ISO 19650 standard, which we, we played here on developing. So could you slip back one slide? Um, uh, so in parallel though, we were trying to ensure that we were able to work jointly with the industry and also across the, the wider public sector in order to ensure that we were making maximum use of, of BIM capability. So in 2015, we set a, a clear direction through the publication of the Digital uh, Britain Strategy. Um, this was just before the BIM Level 2 mandate entered into force. In 2016, we created the, the UK BIM Alliance of Working with Industry. We also had parallel groups across local government and the home nations with the uh, aim of getting everybody to work collectively towards a common objective, which is building our national BIM capability, supporting the um, adoption of BIM technologies, and then looking to the future fully integrating BIM and the wider concept of information management into our business as usual processes when it came to the, the development and the delivery of construction uh, projects and programmes. So where we have reached now is um, a position where we have, I think, largely embedded BIM in the, um, the development, in, in the delivery of government policy programmes. Sorry, uh, it doesn't seem to be moving on. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, as I mentioned, 2011, the government construction strategy, then the, the UK BIM working group. But we also established the UK BIM programme with a focus on facilitating the development of the market and really creating that client side pull combined with the supply chain push to uh, drive the uh, adoption and the uptake of BIM. We also invested quite a lot of time and, and effort in the continuous improvement of BIM. And more recently, um, we've been focused on addressing some of the other issues that you, you always get with the rapid development of uh, information technologies around the uh, data, ensuring data interoperability and the ability to transfer that between systems and avoiding creating a big problem where we have lots of very important information, but it's held on legacy systems or in legacy formats that um, get increasingly harder to access. And if you try and transfer the information, there's the risk that it gets corrupted. And we also worked uh, internationally with a range of other countries to share knowledge, share expertise, but also to try and bring people together into, in the International Standards Organization to agree the ISO 19650 standard which has provided a huge fillet for UK firms trading overseas. And we've seen UK firms um, 
use the knowledge and expertise that they gained here and as a result of the BIM mandate to export this service very successfully to areas of the world like Latin America or East Asia where traditionally British exporters have not done um, particularly well compared to uh, firms from other countries. So it, it's something where the UK has developed and it seems to have developed a, a strong competitive advantage compared to, to, to many other organisations. And that's something that we, we're committed to retaining in future, which is why we are um, looking to the, the future and the next generation of uh, digital programmes in relation to built environment, particularly the UK National Digital Twin Programme, which we, we established in, in 2017. Um, following the publication of the Data for the Public Good report by the National Infrastructure Commission, which is a long-term, very ambitious programme that will ultimately aim to digitalise and then digitally connect all significant buildings and infrastructure within the UK, which will give us uh, an incredible potential uh, to manage the built environment in a holistic way. And uh, we've also um, tried to put the uh, uh, ensure that BIM is fully reflected in some key policy documents like the, the construction playbook. So can we move one slide on? Um, and if I just uh, quote um, some of the, 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 the text on this, we've been clear in it that contracting authorities should use the UK BIM framework to standardise the approach to generating classifying data and also manage issues such as data security and data exchange. We need to embed digital technologies, including the UK BIM framework. We're doing this to improve the performance, sustainability and value of money, the money, the projects and programmes. And post Grenfell and the introduction of the Building Safety Act, the UK BIM framework is absolutely critical to the delivery of the golden thread of building information that needs to be developed by the designer, contractor, and then ultimately owned by the operator of any high risk residential buildings. And I think that the fact that we're able to do this in relation to high-risk residential buildings is something that is going to inform wider construction practice. And what we will increasingly see across the industry is that even those buildings and infrastructure that are not within the scope of the Act are being built to the same standards and they will have the same level of digitised information held about them that will be updated over their life cycle as high-risk residential buildings. And we also wanted to make sure that these were um, that the BIM was properly embedded in contracts uh, as part of our focus on improving the contractual terms of these and ensuring that contracts do support the outcomes that we want to achieve from projects and programmes. And that includes very much the outcome of producing high quality data and information that we can use within government and potentially make more widely available across society for people to use in various ways, whether it's improving public services or it's in, in generating economic value in one way or another. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, uh, I wanted to end by, by pointing to, to the future and what it is we're, we're trying to achieve. Um, the picture that you see now was something that we developed as our vision for the built environment as part of the Transforming Infrastructure Performance Roadmap to 2030 that we published in 2021. And this is probably the single most ambitious vision that government has set for how it wants to manage the built environment uh, in, in over a quarter of a century. And what we are really attempting to do with this is say the built environment exists to deliver the societal outcomes that we want to achieve. Here, um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, sitting below that are the policies that government introduces uh, in order to achieve those objectives. And a lot of those obviously relate to investment in not just the physical aspects of the built environment, but the services that it delivers as well. Below that, you have a decision-making layer where individuals take decisions about the operation of these built assets and the systems and networks that they're a part of or the services that they provide with a view to optimising these, and also decisions about new investments and new construction projects that they want to make, as well as the relationship between the built environment and the natural environment. And all of this collectively comprises a very complex system of systems that at the moment we don't adequately understand and therefore we can't optimise and we can't ensure that clear line of sight 
between the societal outcomes that we want and the individual actions that are being taken um, in relation to public services or to various assets that we manage. And we want to change that and be able to take those decisions based on a clear understanding of what is going to happen in relation to a particular asset, if we intervene in a certain way, but also what the consequences are for the wider systems that it's a part of, the interaction of those with other systems, and then also on the built environment. And clearly, the only way that we can do this is if we comprehensively digitize the built environment, parts of the natural environment, and the services that we provide. And BIM and the information that we derive about the built environment is absolutely going to be at the heart of this process. And it's going to be one of the things that feeds an incredibly valuable source of data into this structure. And it enables us to make better decisions that uh, represent better value for money for the taxpayer, optimize the operation of the built environment and, and services, and ultimately contribute to improving the environment, supporting sustainable economic growth and delivering some of the social outcomes in terms of better health and better education that we want to see. So I, I will stop there uh, and I will hand over to uh, Anne Kemp, uh, the chair of NEMA and technical director at Atkins, who will, will talk about where we are in relation to, to BIM now. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Fergus. Uh, so yeah, I'm really pleased to be able to be with you today. Um, and I think exploring now, um, if you can move to the next slide, please, um, what, what that means in practice. Uh, what we're really driving at here is better information management across the whole of the built and the natural environment. So building on what Fergus has presented, the experiences over the last uh, 10 years and more of what needs to happen on the ground. Next slide, please. So, yeah, brutal although, though it may seem, uh, I think still from a construction perspective, uh, industry perspective, we're seeing very much as being an inefficient and a misaligned industry. So, so from a point of view of managing information better, how can we actually now achieve that? Next slide, please. And what, it, what, what it essentially has led to, um, simplistically perhaps, but I think we all agree that there is an aging and rather creaking infrastructure. And our maintenance program is certainly not as efficient as we would wish it to be. Next slide, please. So what are we really seeking then in talking about digital maturity um, and improved management of information? Well, what we would hope has been happening and needs to continue to happen is that over time, there is an increased understanding of the information that people need to perform their tasks better. That may be, for instance, uh, from the fire safety perspective and uh, the golden thread um, that's being discussed following the Grenville. It might be about managing our water resource better and understanding well what is the information which is actually going to help us to understand what's going on, what the supply issues are, what the maintenance challenges are around the, the, the network and how to actually resolve that. Next slide please. If we have that better information, then it should be possible to ask for information and supply it in a consistent way. So looking at it from a, uh, from a perspective, let's go now, but still with the building safety and the fire safety. It should be possible for us to say, actually, there is a common purpose around that, and there should be common information requirements. So rather than each client be uh, coming up with their own checklist of information, Actually, we can pull together that this is the information that's required collectively, and this will be the best way to actually provide it. And that will help the industry and the supply chain to be able to give that information in a much more efficient way. Next slide, please. And what does that mean? 
Well, leading to sharing that information across the supply chain and throughout the asset life cycle in a consistent way means that that information can be used appropriately and potentially for many uses. But what we can be doing within the background of uh, the old 1192 and now 9650 is to be able to do that in a secure, consistent and appropriate way. So on the screen here, you'll see, just as uh, Fergus was referring to, the system of systems, we have a whole number of different interfaces to this information. It may well be the trades, it may well be the people who are doing the maintenance, whether it be the plumbers or the electricians. It may be the designers, it could well be the planners or regulators. At the end of the day, though, what we would like it to be is for it to actually be there to serve the end users as well. And what we need to ensure is that that information therefore is available in a way that can be used readily by all those different people with different capabilities uh, digitally uh, and different ways of viewing it, whoever they are. Next slide, please. So it should enable people to use new tools. So this is that widening of the digital maturity based on managing our information better, they should then now be able to, for their specific task, be able to use the most accurate information in the way which is helpful to them, whoever they are, uh, whether they're comfortable uh, with the latest technology or whether they're a bit further back in how they actually want to apply uh, the, the, uh, the tasks that they're actually having to fulfill. Next slide, please. So, yeah, as an example, I think we're all knowing I'm going to be waiting for my Sainsbury's delivery uh, later on tonight. I'm, the food industry seems to have got this up, don't they? Um, it's really easy to make orders and to be able to say, actually, I'd like this to be delivered at a certain time. And our vision is, well, why aren't we doing that actually within the built environment industry? Why isn't it possible actually for us to be able to plan our tasks and say, to actually fulfill this task, maybe that it's to install a new uh, um, new pump. Uh, uh, but why, why isn't it possible to say, right, I actually need this bit of kit, uh, these tools to be able to enable this and have that on order and delivered on time. So these are all the things that we need, but we need that connection between all the different stakeholders, whether that be the manufacturers, distributors, the people who are actually having to fulfill that task. Next slide, please. So where we are aiming for is to have an efficient and a streamlined industry, whereby this data-driven approach is actually enabling both current and future work to be planned and completed safely and securely and to the right specification. And then that's on record. You then know what has happened. So we then the building safety, for instance, you would know what was the building designed for, what's actually happened during maintenance whilst it's been in use, and therefore what response would need to, to occur if uh, an accident occurs. Next slide, please. So over time, where we should be getting to, and there are good case studies coming out, that it's possible to manage assets across the whole of the built environment for all of these myriad different activities and be able to coordinate their use, operation and maintenance. It is and should be possible and easier to achieve, whether that be for travel, whether it be for energy supply and consumption, or indeed whether it would be for an emergency response situation. Next slide, please. So, fundamentally, with trusted data, great things can happen. But how do we achieve that? Next slide, please. If you can go back, please, that's it. So, what is NEMA? I think um, Fergus has already mentioned, and a lot of you on the call, I think, will recognise the UK Bill Alliance, which includes Building Smart UK and Ireland. Over the past year, uh, we've actually relaunched now as NEMA, um, with its origins in the Greek language, meaning thread. 
And the reason why we've done this is that we've, in trying to actually explain how to manage information better across the whole of the built environment, for better or worse, the term BIM had become misunderstood, misused, and wasn't helping us engage with the, the whole life management of the built environment. So the facilities management, asset management would say, oh, well, that's just design and construction. It's not relevant to us. Now, although our intent, certainly with the development of uh, the ISO 19650 series, is that it's whole life, it was clearly holding us back in being able to help people to engage and say, oh, okay, I understand the relevance now. Can you help me to implement that? So that's really what's motivated the change in pain. Next slide, please. So what are we about? Our ultimate vision, very much as Fergus has described, is a thriving and sustainable built and natural environment which is transformed by exploiting purpose-driven data. So it's not for the sake of information management, certainly not what motivates me, but if we can look at purpose and then say, to actually achieve that, I need this specific information and how I need that information, it can really transform what we can achieve. Next slide, please. So our mission as NEMA is, on a number of fronts. We do want to inspire, we do want to influence, but importantly, we want to connect across the industry and support everyone who's active in the built environment and enable them to better manage the information, which is vital to so many of the challenges and needs of our times. So we've got a number of different things that we want to be achieving. Next slide, please. We as trusted advisors, and clearly we need to make sure that we are, um, we are able then to facilitate that implementation and integration of practical information management practice across our built and environmental infrastructure. And the emphasis is on practical implementation and how that can be achieved. Next slide, please. Our goals are to do this, is to provide leadership across the UK BIM framework, along with the British Standards Institution, to drive a data-centric attitude to the built environment, and to work with other transformation initiatives to inform, to collaborate, and help to add value to, to those transformation initiatives. And we're making some really good progress in that, but we want to achieve more. Next slide, please. So starting with the UK BIM framework, so obviously this is a BSI uh, webinar um, and we're working really hard across BSI and NEMA to ensure that the UK BIM framework is robust and it really is the overarching approach to implementing information management using uh, what we've inherited from BIM in the UK. And the framework itself consists of standards, and guidance, and resources, all available on the website. Next slide, please. Currently, the standards set out within the UK BIM framework are as follows. If you can press uh, forward, please. I should get a list of those. Um, so you'll see that over the past um, five or so years, actually what we've been able to do is to move the 1192 series into the ISO world. So we've got parts one, which is the concepts and principles, and then part two and three, which are really setting out how to approach better management of information across both delivery and the operational phase. A key part of this is, well, what is the information exchange? How can we actually enable that? And then part five is adding that security-minded approach. We're currently working on the health and safety part of that, through ISO, which should hopefully uh, work its way through the system over the next couple of years. And we've still got 8536 um, as a part of the framework. Uh, you'll uh, understand as we go forward within the webinar that we've got a systematic review, uh, which will go for vote in the autumn. Uh, and this will give us an opportunity, I feel, to uh, really be able to say, okay, 
9650, we've learned some of the lessons of how to make that clearer and we'll uh, make sure that those are actually uh, encompassed now within the review and the update, which will happen over the next two, three years. Next slide, please. And just as uh, Fergus had said, the UK BIM framework is referenced within the Construction Leadership Council's um, um, playbook, uh, but also in the Transforming Infrastructure Performance, there is the Information Management Mandate, which references the UK BIM framework. So currently the guidance set within the UK BIM framework includes that guidance zero now, which came out over the last year, which is really building the case, the business case for information management. And then you've got guidance on each part of the ISO 19650 series, which will be revealed as we click through. So there you are, you've got the um, guidance for each of the sections and also checklists and resources uh, for those. We've got frequently asked questions uh, on that, but I think what we're really, really keen on is that we do want you to feed back. If you see that there's anything that needs more clarification um, that you don't understand, or even things which you know of, which could really help um, uh, understanding and implementation, please do get in touch with us. Next slide, please. So for instance, if we look at guidance part D, uh, we can see how it can help with clarifications, things that we're not actually able to do within the published ISO. So if you click on the, the, for, for the image coming up, uh, here you can see that what we're really after and wanting to explain is the information receiver, essentially, if we say the appointing part of the client, does need to understand well, what are the uh, purposes uh, that they're needing to address, and what are the information requirements to serve those purposes? And to actually say, this is how we need that information to, uh, to be exchanged. Then the information provider absolutely knows what it is that he needs to deliver to satisfy those information requirements. Next slide, please. So we've also got this infographic, which gives you a summary of what uh, and where you can go for help. So for instance, if you're on information delivery planning, uh, planning how and when to deliver the information, it now gives you hints about, well, what are the questions, what are the benefits, where you need to go for help on that. Next slide, please. So the other element of NEMA is Building Smart, the UK and Ireland chapter. Um, it's been powered by the Alliance since 2015. And this is continuing uh, with the project activities of NEMA and Building Smart being much more visible, integrated and accessible to industry and to yourselves. Next slide, please. And what is uh, Building Smart really about? Well, it's certainly about establishing and helping people in, in, in implement the interoperability standards. There's use case management tools, there's information data specification tools being developed, and then there's that open collaboration with the BIM collaboration formation, the BCF. All of these things which sound a little bit, and we've got the, the good old synonyms here, uh, but if you actually start to go onto the website, you'll see that it's becoming much more um, achievable um, and understandable uh, for, for the layman. Next slide, um, if you click on the, uh, to progress through, thank you. Uh, so we've actually got right the way across the different domains and we've got now representation from the UK and Ireland in the international community. And I think what's really important as you click through this slide is that we're really drawing on industry practitioners. Uh, so again, it's that practitioner side of things and it's really important if you can get involved to, to, to come in and help. So we need to be moving from theory into putting these into practice, as Fergus says, consistently across the industry. So not having the silos, but being able to have open interoperable data uh, being available to support uh, the different initiatives, just like with the, the, the National Digital Twin Program that Fergus was referring to. Next slide, please. 
there's also then the professional smart uh, uh, building smart certification uh, which please do go on to that so this is to really target people who are providing uh, uh, training uh, and can now get uh, certified um, and to be able to issue that uh, training to, 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 to industry. And how does the interface work with NEMA? So NEMA is really focusing overall on the process and ISO 19650 in the UK BIM framework, building smart on the technology side of things, so the IFC as expressed by 16739, and bringing those together and being able to implement those together really ensures that we can drive maximum value. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, as I say, the domains which are being represented as we click through includes airport, building, construction itself, infrastructure, products, and the railway and regulatory, which is a new uh, domain just being kicked off. There's a technical uh, domain, which is really driving at uh, the specifics of uh, moving forward with technology. We've got the electric and as I say, the professional certification. Next slide, please. And then the other element of NEMA is the gig. Uh, so this is really focusing on helping to deliver valuable interoperable data. And there's a number of elements which have been developed over the last few years. Next slide, please. The focus here is to really close the gap between the standards and the practice how we can do that, how we can really support industry going forward. So another, um, a number of elements being developed as we move forward to the next slide is championing interoperability and supporting the work that the Building Smart um, are moving forward on. So it's that ability to exchange and use information, ensuring that it's independent of the technology used to drive it. So as I've mentioned, having a defined purpose, having an audit trail of the information to support the golden thread, ensuring we've got quality and reliability around the information and that it can be exchanged digitally across the contract line. And another element which I think is often forgotten or overlooked is that longevity. So how we can ensure that it can be used continuously through the whole asset life cycle and isn't left behind as technologies change. Next slide, please. So one of the things which has been developed is a specification for an information management platform. This has been uh, developed with, um, with the government departments who are still investigating this side of things and looking at how a platform can actually be brought together to actually help with the governance of this management of information. Next slide, please. The code of practice, there's been a number of uh, uh, presentations on this and encouraging the technology providers to really sign up to this to ensure that actually they buy into this interoperability code of practice for technologies. So some really good progress being made and I know Fergus, you were at the launch um, of this earlier this year at the Institution of Civil Engineers. Next slide please. So we've got NEMA, as I say, focusing very much on the UK BIM framework, driving through on uh, the initiatives uh, of uh, government over the past 10 years. We've got Building Smart, focusing on the technology, uh, for instance, IFC, the in, uh, Industry Foundation classes uh, through the ISO. And then we've got the GIG, it's really helping on that practical support across the whole of the industry. Next slide, please. So, as NEMA, we've really pushed on our online presence. So, we're using uh, these all sorts of different uh, platforms, the ones you would probably expect uh, on the website, uh, through uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, but we're also pushing through Instagram, TikTok, Spotify. And part of this is to ensure that we're really reaching the widest uh, um, uh, uh, group of people that we possibly can, including. Uh, the people who are moving in from uh, from schools, uh, universities, and indeed from apprenticeships. Next slide, please. So, and we're developing success stories. Um, 
And these don't need to be, and I think it's really important to emphasise this, this doesn't need to be, um, you know, implementing all of the UK BIM framework and the 19650 and so forth all at once. Even if it's a small slice, a nugget of that this has really worked for us and show, showing the benefit and being honest about some of the challenges, these are the ones that we're really wanting to talk about. Uh, so please do get in touch if you feel that you've got a good success story. Uh, which will help other people. This is this is again what we're really wanting to do is to help each other, help each other, if, if I can put it quite that way. All right, next slide, please. So the sorts of new relationships that we're developing. Uh, we've got Zero now, a new affiliate member with collaboration, bringing IM to decarbonisation. I think this is really important. Nima isn't expecting or trying to do everything. It's linking different parties up and you know, allowing them to do what they're great at. We don't want to be taking any of that off, but helping people to link to the relevant uh, uh, contacts, which will help them further and they're also interested in. We're bringing on more patrons. Uh, so Bologdon is an international platinum patron who's joined us over this last year, who we're delighted to, to, to have. And I think that's a real uh, thing to emphasize is that we are dependent on patrons to be able to keep NEMA running. We don't have funding per se, uh, so we're really needing to expand our patron uh, scheme. And then, for instance, another um, uh, uh, group that uh, we've um, affiliated with is the Red Foundation, so bringing IM to the, the real estate. Um, and you know, that, it's that collaboration um, across a much, much wider uh, scope that is important, I think, as we move through to you know, whole life and built environment and natural environment. Next slide, please. So, yeah, continuing on this new venture, we've got the Building Safety Alliance, for instance, and that's really helping us in. We've got a group at the moment uh, working on Fire Safety Working Group, um, really being able to understand from the perspective of the technical experts, the, 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 the domain experts, what it is that they need to really figure out how to manage their information better, what that information is. Construction Leadership Council, again, uh, working with Burgess. Um, um, I'm one of the co-leads for the digital uh, stream of the Construction Leadership Council and really helping to push the UK BIM framework. Uh, across the construction industry. And one report which I think you could find uh, very useful, it's really explaining uh, around the Building Smart activities and IFC, really bringing it into a, a, a practical uh, focus. Next slide, please. And coming back to where Fergus was talking is that you know, we're not doing information management for the sake of it. Um, it needs to have purpose, but it is also a real foundation, a real um, to, um, step, a critical step to these other initiatives, whether it be digital twin, whether it be other techs, so cotton tech or prop tech, robotics, IoT. You know, someone was describing it as, uh, you know, if we don't actually have fundamental management of information, uh, we're going to be working more and more in a swamp of information and data, uh, which doesn't give us a focus, isn't allowing us to actually bring everything together in a system of systems approach, um, as described um, uh, in, the, in the TIP program. Next slide, please. So there are definitely openings and opportunities in NEMA. We are completely open to people getting involved. Um, specifically, we really do need that help throughout all parts of NEMA to help industry realise the benefits of the UK BIM framework. And specifically at the moment, we're needing programme managers and further vice chairs. Uh, the vice chairs that we have currently at the moment, uh, Fiona Moore and Katie Rutland are doing a fantastic job, but I don't know how they manage to cover all that they are doing. Um, and given the ambition of NEMA, we certainly need more. So you should uh, be seeing a job advert for that's going out over the next week. Next slide, please. And that's uh, that's it from me. Um, hopefully that provides you with a good picture for what's happening currently. Thank you very much.
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, so what we'll do is, uh, Fergus, if you'd like to come back on camera and we'll start our final session for the break, which is to then start to think about uh, the future and where things are going. Uh, and we've had some questions come through already, which is brilliant. And as a reminder to the audience, if you use that Q&A function, you can get even more in. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I will start us off with our first question and see if it, in, it excites and entices anyone to ask anything related. Um, and it's, it's a rather vague one, so it'll be fine. But I'm always enjoy the fact that people often talk about, which is that when Crossrail started, there were no such things like that. You know, it's a, it's a great example of how we have some fairly long uh, lead in time for some projects and technology and the landscape changes. And certainly in the last 10 years, you know, things have changed quite a lot. So I'm guessing that I will, I will start with you, Fergus, just to kind of uh, prompt you and um, so you can start thinking of your answer as I finish my ramblings is where do you see where do you see us in 10 years time given that you know well 20 years ago some of the tech we were using didn't even exist so what what could be in place that isn't there today and where do you see the direction we're taking things like BIM and information management uh, going forwards and what it might look like in 10 years time um I I think it's it's going to be a hugely exciting decade in terms of digitization of the built environment. And if you, you look at what's going on within firms uh, and also within the research base in terms of the development of the next generation of technologies, I think that what we are going to see is that uh, digitized all technologies, everything from sensors to data analytics to artificial intelligence, AR, VR, advanced modeling and simulation techniques is going to become as prevalent in the built environment as it already is in sectors like manufacturing now and what i can i can see happening is that you are going to have people who are coming up with a whole range of really creative applications and, and, and some of these will be based on bim or they, they will be enhancing bim um, a lot of them will be based on uh, other data that's gathered from assets within the built environment and, and potentially even some of the objects that pass through the built environment uh, that has the capacity to gather and exchange information themselves and, and that at the moment includes trains and cars in future you could see this becoming e-scooters e-bikes and, and, and drones as well so i i think um it's undoubtedly the case that, that digitization is just going to become more and more pervasive but if we're going to maximize the potential of that then I'm afraid that we are going to have to address some of those really difficult blockers to, to change in progress. And uh, the, the two biggest ones are the issues of data quality, consistency, interoperability, and, and how we manage information to ensure that it's secure, reliable, and can be effectively exchanged and used between organizations. And then the second aspect of it is really the human computer and human data interface. And it's how you embed these new technologies within organizational processes and decision-making structures, and you upgrade the skills of people within the workforce to make use of them. And, and that is probably, the, the well, the, they're both enormous challenges, but I, I, I think the organizational one is, the, is maybe the bigger one because the, the rapidity of technological advance means that people and organisations will inevitably struggle to keep up. No, uh, that was interesting. And we can jump on a few points then, right? Yes, first, Anne, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on the question generally? And if, we're, if there are any agreements or disagreements, we can then jump in on a few of those points from Fergus then. No, no, I think uh, Fergus presented that very well. Um, uh, and I think there will be this the, the con continuous um, tension of the ability or amenity to actually adopt new technologies and be able to trust those new technologies. Um, you know, we, we, it's, it's, the, it's the old challenge, isn't it? Is that, that, that you know, often it's the project managers who are resistant because they're the ones who are culpable, they're being held to account for budgets, for, for, for the programme and so forth. And yet, you know, we, we know that we've got um, processes and technologies which could make things more efficient. But it's that huge 
step of trust, isn't it, uh, of, that, that you need to make to, to really make a difference. And I think yeah, that hasn't changed over the last 20 years, and I don't think it's going to. Uh, but somehow being able to lower the bar so it doesn't feel as risky is going to, to, to be really important for us going forward. Now, it's interesting. So I will I'll be cheeky and ask a follow up with that around the trust one. Um, and it's that uh, because I agree with you, the trust is is very important. But I've seen that sometimes not only gets skipped over because what's been really interesting in the last couple of months is watching people play with chat GPT and mm -hmm. these large language models. And the, I haven't seen the same trust barrier there where a lot of organizations have jumped on it very quickly. And you know, I was surprised to discover that some within BSI we use it for some marketing material stuff, I think, to help generate an initial copy or something like that. And I'm I think impressed and flabbergasted at the same time. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you've got any thoughts on why trust hasn't been as much of a barrier for people to use something like ChatGDP in their organisation or, or variations therein, where there might be for some of this other tech. And so you've got, you've got a cheeky smile there, so I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts. Um, no, um, and I did actually have a discussion about this very topic with a professor of AI last week, and, and his theory is that it's because chat GPT and some of these types of generative AI are almost seen as being a bit of a game by people. It, it's all, you interact with it, and okay, I know we're all aware of some of those very embarrassing cases where university students have submitted essays written by chat gpt which have been very good but they forgot to delete the little bit say produced by chat gpt at the bottom um but actually a lot of the questions that people asked here they're, they're very similar to some of the ones that people were asking google in the early stages of the internet or some of the other search engines it's um, questions about myself obscure topics or, or or all of these other things and it's not seen as something that's really important um or or something that you, you need to do that's integrated with the business process or or that's going to have any impact on your life other than perhaps providing you with a, a bit of amusement in the short term um but you can compare that with with some other uh applications for ai and i mean the the one that i'd, I'd pick up on is um a lot of organizations have been using ai to look for defects in things like structures so it could be bridges and railway uh, track is another one and, and people are also starting to use this increasingly um, on roads and I think those things perhaps give us a little bit more insight into the, this, this whole conundrum of human and, and AI interaction and some of the people who've been working on this in the rail industry have, have highlighted a, a few issues I mean firstly it's the ability to get sufficiently good quality data to really train the AI I mean, what they are saying most of the time is you can't rely on existing data sets. They're not good enough and they're not in the right format. Actually, we're having to go out and build our own. And that constrains the areas that we can operate in, because a lot of the time we then have to go out, fly the program drone, particular location, particular ways to get the information. Then we can use it. It takes us a lot of time to actually get this. Whereas if you had a better system across the built environment, you'd be gathering this all of the time. You'd be better able to utilize it. And the other challenge that they've had is where you're, you're trying to get input from domain experts like track inspectors. But these are the very people who think, hang on, this AI, AI might be taking my job. So as well as designing the AI, a lot of the work they've had to do has been on designing some of the systems and processes where you integrate this into an organization as a tool and an aid for human decision making and try and find ways of ensuring that it's not presented as a means of substituting digitization for human activity. And, and I certainly think that's probably going to be the pattern of the next 10 years or so with AI. It, it, acceptance is going to be linked to integration of the user into the, the organizational processes that AI is a part of. No, that's interesting. How about yourself, Anne? Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it, it kind of takes me then to what we were saying about the managing the information and it being purpose driven and it having to take into account the user. Um, is it's that fundamentals, isn't it? Is you know, how you get trusted data into the 
system in the first place, but you're thinking about the user, the, the human at the end of that uh, 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 logic as well. Um, so yeah, I'd agree with what you've said, Fergus, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think this, this starts to lead us into, I think, some of the other questions, and one that we've had through um, from, from David, which is about, um, is are some of these factors you've mentioned, like you mentioned there, Fergus, around steam people's jobs or, or add on the trust aspect, some of the reasons why there's maybe been a slower in uh, uptake than we'd like for some of this digitalization and adoption aspects, but as opposed to keeping it in the negative, this is meant to be future facing and positive. So I guess maybe what I'd like to ask you is what, what should we change or aspire to change to unlock a greater uptake of these things? So if we turn those blockers into, into solutions, what might some of those solutions look like? And you know, my, my more in one which it, you know would, would be changing how we do procurement perhaps and you know mm. less adversarial procurement and maybe even shifting mm. away from charge by hour activities because in that way, and as a couple of you mentioned in the questions, you know, some of that encourages efficiency and, and speed over quality and actually things like the value toolkit and those sort of later things help pull that direction that you know in, in 10 years what would be a real success if we were able to unlock a thing to create this adoption um do you think maybe i'll start with you this time yeah i mean i i think the fundamental barrier to the adoption of digital technologies in the built environment has been that that, that whilst a, a, a significant proportion of the construction industry is very highly skilled the construction industry is brilliant at training people to a very high level, but in a very narrow specialist occupation. And not that many of those occupations have been intrinsically digital. And at the same time, this is not a sector that's been as good at other sectors as uh, pulling in talent from universities or, or other industries which have a higher level of their digital capabilities built. And, and this has been one of the big obstacles to um, adoption, not just digital technologies, but also manufacturing technologies as well. In, in terms of what will change that, what will change that, I think, is the fact that the built environment is so big as a sector, it's so important, there's so much scope for people to do things in it that if we can um, provide the right routes in to the industry and to the, the, the public sector and all of the, the, the other stakeholder organisations, um, there is such potential here for people to do fantastically creative, rewarding things um, in their professional careers that I, I think the built environment could have a much more powerful um, message or mar marketing appeal, I guess it is, to people um, who have got these qualifications because they think actually that there's far more scope for me to work in the built environment and do things that are genuinely going to, to, to change things and have an influence, have a real impact, than if I'm going into an industry which is very heavily digitized and where what they really want me to do is work incredibly intensively on a very narrow area um, because that that's the, what the state of maturity of the technology in that industry really requires me to do so i, I think if we can find a way of um identifying what it is we need and putting the message out then then there is the potential to make the built environment much more attractive to people with these skills and in terms of what would change that, yeah, I, I, I think procurement is, is a good um, area to highlight because it is important that uh, the, the government, when it procures things, does really push information management, data quality, use of BIM, use of these other technologies and, and encourage scope for innovation, deliveries of its projects and programmes. Um, I also think we need to look at the skill system, whether that's the one that publicly funded or it's trained funded by industry. And we need to encourage a high level of integration of, of knowledge and awareness about digital skills and technologies and really mainstream this into the training for construction occupations and professions. I don't think it's about digital bolt-ons. That I think will, will push people away. What you've got to do is start integrating digitization into training for specific uh, occupations and job roles 
in the way that it's been done in other industries. So, so people are aware that the expectation is that you will do certain things in a digital way because it's more efficient, more productive, more accurate and delivers better results. No, that's all that's all very interesting and it chimes quite well with a lot of what I'm getting in the Q&A as well. Some of it is support, Fergus, and the other is, um, I think people say it's quite a similar thing. So interestingly, uh, Malcolm asked a question, well, I think you answered there about avoiding being distracted by seductive technologies. And was that, I, I really enjoyed the term seductive technology. I think the point's there um, that, that you've come through there. So thank you for that. And do you have any other um, ruminations on top of Fergus's insights there? Yeah, I know that. I think uh, coming back to, 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 to your question is that I think one of the opportunities being able to pull the planning and regulatory uh, systems and approach together. Um, so, you yeah, very much, uh, obviously, my geospatial uh, background coming out here is that, you yeah, know, using the 19657 series, really making sure that it is being implemented across whole life. Um, and across the built environment should allow us to actually have a, a planning regime which is able to take much wider scope into account. Um, so you know, we, we, we're reducing the amount of development, for instance, on floodplains. Uh, we're reducing the impact of, uh, um, uh, of draining our water resources by not, not being able to distribute uh, demand in, in, in a more sensible way. Uh, being able to pull it in with the regulatory system as well. So actually when you're doing your, your planning for a, a development, actually it's um, you know, beholden on you to be able to anticipate what the regulatory uh, regime is going to require, not just now, but actually in the future as well. Being able to, uh, to go for proactive maintenance which actually is allowing for us to foresee you know, in five years, 10 years time, what are the, the bits and pieces which are going to be required to keep on running an efficient rail system? Uh, what is going to be required as they develop their uh, technologies? Can we actually foresee and predict that there is going to be a, 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 full sh a, a, a shortfall of a particular product that we'll be needing in five years time? Or you know, if we're looking at climate change, you know, what, what's going to be really putting a strain on the system overall that we really need to be putting uh, into place uh, with, uh, within the planning regime? So I think the exciting side of things is that as we pull all of this together, we should be able to get much uh, better decisions in a way that we've not been able to achieve so far. No, that's really interesting. And again, you know, that it chimes well with some of the questions I'm seeing coming through. Um, and a, a follow on, which if you wouldn't mind jumping straight back on here, is that I think Anthony's asked about um, mandating industry specific information requirements. I guess, in a way, if you're talking about this idea of this, uh, there, there are, let, let's call them. UK PLC use cases almost, where it is information that we need to have and manage. And the example in the UK there may be about material scarcity could be one of them to manage you know, the supply chain distribution there. Uh, and in, I think when we've looked at some of the work coming out of SEN ISO, at one point, I think they were trying to use the term regulatory information requirements, I think at one point, which was quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in things like the, um, so the statutory instruments for the Building Safety Act, there was the Key Building Information uh, Act as well, which started talking about some information that was required from a regulatory point. So could we in 10 years perhaps see this idea of regulatory information requirements or something similar? And what do you think? Well, I, I do think that, and that would be extremely helpful as well. So rather than clients having to scratch their heads thinking, what, what is it that I require? I think, yeah, you know, the and um, I was helping on the standard information approach uh, work over the last couple of years. I think it was perfectly within our reach to be able to say this is a particular problem set, and these are the information requirements which will help to actually inform that. Um, if then, you know, from a uh, from a government or even from an industry leadership perspective, we can either then start setting up a library which it's suggested or strongly suggested or even mandated that people use, it would 
introduce massive efficiencies, I would suggest, into the system. No, that's great. I mean, first, what are your thoughts on it? Obviously, one, being on, on, on the government side, uh, I guess also at the same time, I'm aware of some of the things talked about in things like the TIP roadmap and others with things like the National Metrics Library and these other things. So I guess there's aspirations to collect certain bits of data to be able to do more uh, project analysis and other things. So does this sound like an approach that that UK government may likely take? Well, and, and you, you can argue we've already crossed the Rubicon in some ways with the Building Safety Act and the requirement for the golden thread of information. I mean, that is now a, a, a legal requirement of that those who are designing, building or managing certain kinds of buildings deemed to be high risk now have to provide and update this information. Um, will we ever go as far as mandating everything absolutely across the economy? No, I'm not sure, but I, I, I could certainly see that in future, we would get to a point where for certain critical sectors, um, which are national infrastructure related or, or just where there's an overwhelming public interest in having access to information that could be used by different actors to manage these more efficiently. Yes, there are standardized information requirements that are applied and that could be things like the utilities. Um, it would obviously apply to road and rail and things within the, the, the public sector as well. Um, it might even in future apply to certain, say, large private sector users of, of energy, where you've got, in a world of distributed energy generation storage systems, um, facilities that are going to take a particularly large amount of power, and therefore potentially their operation could have an impact on, on, on the operation of other facilities or, or homes or anything else that, that's connected to that part of the grid. So, yes, I, I, I think in principle there is likely to be um, an evolution towards standardisation of data requirements. So I think part of that will be regulatory, but I do think as well part of it will be the market logic of this, because in, in the same way that we've seen um, people wanting to be consistent in terms of things like the BIM standard, if we have wider and more consistent information requirements, it's easy for everybody to act within that market. They know um, what uh, is required for them in terms of to have in terms of capability to, to participate in the market. And they also have confidence that people aren't doing what we've seen with markets of personal and other types of data, basically creating little gated communities where you have to use a certain system or be. Uh, on a certain network to gain access to this. And that's something that we emphatically don't want to happen in relation to, to the built environment. And the National Infrastructure Commission summed it up in, in the data for the public good report. The objective here is public good in perpetuity. And that means that we have to have a functioning market that's an open market and accessible to all participants. And having standardized data requirements and a clear set of, of, of regulatory rules and guidelines, standards, and other things that, that um, frame the operation of that market and set the parameters for the people within it, I think ultimately is something that, that people will see as beneficial and support. Oh, that's very really interesting, thank you. Uh, you started talking there about uh, golden thread and fire aspects, and I guess uh, one of the couple of questions that have come through, for example, like from Paul, is also asked about things like climate change, carbon, and other areas. And a small insight I'll give is I was on the uh, zero call this morning because they've got um, this underwrite the digital pillar for their playbook and you know obviously Anne's already mentioned the relationship there with, with zero through NEMA and other bits and pieces and one of the interesting things from that call this morning was I think they're trying to understand do they talk about digital in its own right or do they talk about digital enabling other priority areas like safety carbon management and other things and it, it seems to be an interesting struggle in the way of do we talk about digital as being great for itself or digital as the enabler of these other great outcomes we want to achieve and i guess we've already talked about um a fire as we said but i guess it's just what are your thoughts on is is it is digital an enabler or is it sort of this great thing in itself is it both and actually in in that kind of future way do we see it helping more things and we always talked about that it's going to get more pervasive but do we see that narrative shift of it's not necessarily doing bim or information management, it is doing information management to realise net zero uh, as the, the future narrative, say perhaps. 
uh, I guess, uh, given that you talked about zero, uh, do you want to start us off? Yeah, so it's, it is an enabler, uh, absolutely. Um, and as, as I've referenced already, you know, I, it's, it's, you know, if we try to eat the elephant and do it all at the same time, it seems very overwhelming. But if we can be looking at you know, the building safety side of things, uh, zero and the carbon decarbonisation side of things and just gradually build out, if you like, this library of information requirements. And when I say that, that's not a checklist of I, Y, X, Y, Z. It's actually yeah, but how much information will be required, how should that be exchanged, what's the format, how will it be used. So those are, it's the information requirements is rather more than just a checklist of X, Y, Z. Um, but if we can gradually build that out, working together as industry and sharing best practice. I think we'll make some really good progress, but I think it is not trying to eat the elephant all at once. It's an important aspect of this. That's interesting. Any extra bits from you folks? No, I mean, I, I, I think Anna's really covered everything. I mean, I, I think it is important that we, we understand that, that digital is definitely an enabler and Yes, I mean, there, there will always be a, a group of people that do want to push on with the, the development of digital technology and make them ever more sophisticated, and, and that is important. But the real value of any innovation comes from widespread adoption. This is Innovation Economics 101. And it's important that we don't lose that connection with um, individuals and with organisations who are going to be the people who need to use these systems really efficiently and effectively if they are going to be better at doing their jobs and get the benefits uh, of using these technologies themselves but also for society more widely. No, that's great, thank you. Uh, I'm conscious of time because this has gone incredibly quickly and we only have about five minutes left for this session. Uh, is there we started on time? I'm, I'm amazed that we, we've almost got through half an hour. Uh, but what I will do is uh, I've got try and squeeze two more questions in. One is your final thoughts, so you can start to coalesce those as we go now. Uh, but one or two questions have come in about how in the next 10 years we can promote things like adoption in other sectors and industries and, and get more of that happening. And some of the questions, and, and these aren't plans that I promise, have been about terminology and plain language and, and those sort of aspects to it. I think one example was almost things like, you know, BDP, MIDP, and those sort of elements and those sort of things. And actually, if we're trying to, to improve adoption and stuff, do we think going towards plainer language may be a way to get there? Uh, not saying anything particular needs to go or stay, but that plainer language element is, is a thought of getting someone like the city managers and the asset managers more involved in the digital option as an example. I guess, what are your thoughts on? how we might improve their engagement and whether plainer language is a way of doing so and i guess maybe uh, as i as i picked on you slightly there and maybe we'll start with you on that one yeah i'm uh, well, what we're certainly looking at and why we want to engage with for instance facilities managers is we need to be able to present relevant parts of the process captured within life in 1950 expressed in their language, in language which is what they understand and feel comfortable with. Um, I think the difficulty when you're developing an ISO standard is you can only state it once, and indeed you have to have it in a way that uh, around the world the language works. So that's why there had to be a shift from a UK perspective. We had to take into account European, South, North American, Far East language and understanding as well. But when we move to the UK BIM framework and the guidance and then just hands on helping people, it's really important we actually, I think saying plain language is maybe that's not good enough, is that each domain, each uh, specialism has its own language and doesn't need to know all of 19650. I think this is one of the traps we've got into with BIM Level 2. People felt that they needed to know the whole of BIM Level 2 and its history and all the rest of it. And actually, does a plumber really need to know that? Is it relevant to them? So I think cherry picking what is actually needed by an individual or a group of people and making sure that it's 
resonates with them in their own language is what's important. So I think saying plain language is probably a bit simplistic. And maybe I'm being over ambitious, but those are the sorts of things that we're wanting to look at and explore and you know, get help with. No, it, that's interesting. And you know, I guess in one way that shows the value of so the work Nima's done with the guidance, because I'm also aware there have been talks before about persona based and could you actually change some of the bits you know, in that way. And I guess it, it is very interesting to have this idea of their language as opposed to plain language. So that's really interesting. Now. And how about yourself, Fergus? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I, I think plain, plain language is, is really uh, uh, the, the concept that sits behind this is accessibility. And, and that's really what we're talking about and, and ease of use. And I, I don't think it, it, it's simply about the language. I mean, in, in some ways, it's about making use of the potential of these systems that to facilitate human interaction with them. So just as a practical example, on Tuesday, um, we hosted a, a, a demonstration of our integration architecture the National Digital Twin, which is a prototype about to demonstrate it on the Isle of Wight. And we started with the conventional PowerPoint presentation, just set out the structure of all of this. It's all very clever if you've got a software engineering degree or, or a lot of expertise in IT hardware systems. It doesn't engage people at all. Then we moved on to some of the, 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 the more basic data analysis of this. And one of the things that we were looking at was um, an assessment of energy efficiency of properties on the Isle of Wight that's gathered from open data sources. And you've got a little chart and you superimpose it on a crude map of the island. People think it's a bit more interesting, but they don't get really engaged with it. Then you run this data set through a gaming engine and you get computer game quality graphics and projections of these homes onto a realistic map of the Isle of Wight. And the energy in the room just goes like this immediately the level of engagement goes up 100% in a matter of 30 seconds because people just look at this stuff and think, wow, that's so easy to use, it's so easy to interface with, and I understand what you're saying now. So actually, if you, you think about this from the user perspective and you make these systems intuitive and engaging, you maximise the potential of the technology, you will get user buy into it. Oh, that's right, thank you. And then as we are, we are, Technically, one minute over, but as it's my event, I can I can flex the timing as I like. Um, and for, for those in the audience who might recall in the late 90s when we had Mystic Meg on, I think, the National Lottery Live, <laughs> what I'm going to do is make this final point almost the um, if, if you were given the role of Mystic Meg, both of you, and I'll try and come up with my own as well, what is the one prediction of what will have changed between now and in 10 years from now? And what I warn you is, is that when we do this event in 10 years time, I'll replay yeah. this part of the video and we will test to see how accurate we were. Um, so maybe, Anne, we'll start with you uh, as I desperately try to think of what my 10 year prediction will be. So I have great faith in the um, uh, generation following us. Um, and I think the sense I have is that the level of awareness and responsibility they have and the understanding of that the world is actually a very complex uh, interaction of numerous systems which need to be understood together. I think some of the things that we have made really hard work won't be there anymore because they'll come from mm. it from a very different, if you like, philosophical position than we have. So I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to hand over some of the good in our inheritance, but actually I have great faith in the generations coming. Hmm. Thank you, Fergus, how about yourself? I mean, in, in, in 10 years time, um, I actually think that in, in the context of large projects, uh, probably 80% of the work and probably 80% of the value as well is actually going to be in the information management and the process of designing it, planning it, modeling and, and simulation of various pathways for the construction of the built asset, the oversight of the construction project, and then actually designing in the systems that gather information and data that then enable us to, to optimize that asset and use this information in, in, in lots of other ways. And actually, in some ways, I think the physical infrastructure um yes it's going to still add quite a lot of value to society it's going to be important for a whole range of reasons 
but actually what investors, asset managers and others are increasingly going to focus on, what their, their strategies from obtaining value from their investment are going to be based on is around the management of information and the creative use of data. And I think that's going to be an absolutely massive shift for sectors like um, property development, as well as infrastructure and other asset management and financial services as, as the backers of this. I think it's going to be absolutely transformational. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. And uh, my, my, my punt will be that uh, I think the next generation are going to break procurement in the next 10 years. And I think that given how many of them have, have gone through university and stuff now, hearing about great things like insurance back alliance in and you know, those sorts of more collaborative models, I think once once they get into management positions over the next five, you know, five, 10 years, they'll be in the position to say, well, actually, I don't want to do it the old way. I want to. This is how I want to do it. I think something will break as that the, the critical mass shifts on those things. And I remember 10 years ago saying I thought that construction management forms a contract would become the default because of things like BIM and, and Adelaide 92, because I thought clients had to be sufficiently intelligent that surely they wouldn't want to use a tier one. They'd want to control it and everything else. And unfortunately, I was proved wrong then as I am now. Uh, but who knows in, in another decade's time. Um, so what we'll do is we will call the discussion panel there. So thank you both very much for joining us for the discussion panel. That's been incredibly valuable. And thank you for your presentations. Um, there's just some really good insights locked in there. Um, and we will move straight into our comfort break. So I think if we can throw the comfort break slide up, if you wouldn't mind. Um, you'll see there then, the next section is going to be on the Miro app, which we will resume at half past. So you'll have a five minute comfort break. I recommend you stretch your legs maybe step into your back garden, or if you're in the home office, at least walk uh, over and get yourself some coffee or tea or something. And when we come back, David and Anna will take us through the 19650 feedback session so we can hear your thoughts to inform our position on where we think it should go in the future going forwards. But for now, we'll drop And we are back. So thank you very much for sticking with us. I hope that you've managed to stretch your legs, uh, manage to relax a bit, get yourself a drink, uh, refresh yourself ready for this next session. Uh, so without further ado, um, what we'll do is we'll introduce uh, the breakout session on Miro or Miro, um, all pronunciation is approximate. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll pass over to um, Anna and David who are going to lead the session. And I believe Anna, it is over to you. Thanks, Dan, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, and welcome to this feedback session on ISO 19650. Um, just by way of introduction, I'm a lead standards development manager at BSI, and I manage the B555 technical committee, which is responsible for the UK's input into the ISO 19650 series of standards. As mentioned by Anne earlier, part one and part two of ISO 19650 are due to be available for systematic review later in the year. And for those of you who are not familiar with this process, um, the systematic review is something that takes place for every standard, at least every five years after publication. And it's undertaken to ensure that standards remain up to date and globally relevant. As part of this process, the national standards bodies, including BSI, review the standard to determine if it's still valid, um, if it should be revised, or in some cases, if it should be withdrawn. And in the UK, BSI consults with the relevant technical committee to determine the response to the systematic review. And in the case of the ISO 19650 series, uh, this is the technical committee known as B555. B555 and BSI are also keen to get feedback from the wider sector um, on the, the systematic review. And this webinar session today is an opportunity for you to provide that feedback and provide your comments on 19650 to inform the UK's response. At this time, we are looking for feedback on, firstly, if the standards should be revised, uh, secondly, comments on what is currently working, so what's good about those standards, 
what could be improved and what could be added. I do want to note that the focus should be on refining or clarifying the technical content rather than making fundamental changes to the standards. Um, as Dan has mentioned, we will be using the mirror board to capture your comments and we would like those comments to be structured so that they provide a statement or suggestion about a particular aspect of the standard or standards, along with a reason for that suggestion or statement or a proposed change. This is the kind of format that we will use to feedback to ISO as it makes it easier for those who are reading the comment to understand our point of view and to understand the solution that is being put forward. I will say that we are not looking for comments relating to editorial errors or typos or indeed the national annex. Um, the ISO systematic review is an international process and it will not be looking at national annexes as part of that process. That's something which is done at a national level. Please also don't add anything for which you don't own the copyright or the IPR. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to David, who's going to provide some additional context and will take you through the mirror board for this session. David, over to you. Thank, thank you, Anna. Um, that, that's great. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and just to introduce myself to you, I'm David Churcher. Uh, I'm a consultant in information management and I've been working with Anne Kemp uh, for the last um, eight or nine years in the development of the ISO 19650 standards. Um, I was the technical author for 19650 part one, which is the concepts and principles of information management using BIM. Um, and at the same time, we were developing ISO 19650 part two um, with, the same, with the same group. And I was involved in those discussions as well. Uh, so those are the two standards that are currently uh, being identified for for review so um, as well as this session that we have today uh, we've had some other feedback sessions as well uh, there was a, a, a workshop held at uh, digital construct um, a couple months ago um, and so talking week a couple of and we're also talking to uh, other groups within NEMA and also the the UK's sort of international presence around uh, BIM and information management to get their feedback as well. So there's quite a lot going on, and what we gather this afternoon will add to the uh, the, the quantity and quality of the feedback that we can uh, collate and uh, present back to ISO to make the case if we think that's the right thing uh, to open a review of these two standards. So as has been mentioned, we're going to use uh, Miro to um, to go through the, the, the feedback process. So I'm just going to share my screen now and hopefully you will see a Miro board and I'll then um, spend a couple of moments uh, just explaining uh, how we're going to work for the, uh, for the afternoon. So um, I'm hoping that is now visible on the, on the shared screen, the, the Miro board. Um, I believe I'm sharing. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, what you should be able to see uh, is an overview of the Miro board with three areas of focus in it, um, which we have, uh, which we've named Rose, Thorn and Bud. And what we're going to do over the next 45 minutes is to look at three different aspects of feedback on the standards in turn. Ah, I think I'm seeing some uh, comments that, that we're not seeing the uh, the, the yes. board. Sorry, David, I think at least, at least for me, I can see a white screen at the moment. Um, okay. Um, well, I pressed the button to say share, and it looks, it tells me I'm sharing my Google Chrome window, which should have the mirror uh, so board I, on it. I can see it now, interestingly. Um, so it may be a... A, a zoom aspect so maybe if you try extending your window but not maximizing it that might work that i can see that now ah right is that better uh sorry if that was um uh, hopefully that is better for everybody um i have kept it zoomed out i will zoom in um as i as i take you through what we're going to be doing for the next in the next uh, 45 minutes 
So we're going to tackle each of the three sub areas of the board in turn. Uh, the rows area, um, which I will zoom in on, is going to be focusing on things that are working well in the, the ISO 19650 standards, parts one and two, and that's really the only two parts that we are we're thinking about this afternoon. So things that you have um, seen from your experience where, where things are good, things are, are okay, it, it's helpful for us to know that uh, because other countries in the international community might want to change things that we are very happy with in the UK and we want to be able to push back against that. So it's good, it's always helpful to get um, information about what, what is working well. That'll be the first session that we, that we work with. Uh, the second session that we work with will be to look at the thorns, which are the things that are not working well, where you might have particular challenges or issues with um, the way the standard um, expresses certain ideas or the way that it is um, uh, e expressing certain uh, terminology, for example. So um, that, those are the thorns that we'd like you to cover. Those, that's in the second uh, session of, of the afternoon. And then uh, the third session is going to be looking at BUDS, so opportunities for improvement, for um, adding perhaps new ideas or, or presenting things differently um, where we can, we can um, uh, improve the way that the standards work. So those are the three aspects of uh, feedback that we are going to be collecting. And in each case, um, I'm going to be asking you to uh, engage with Miro and the, the link to the Miro board that I'm showing you is going to be put in the chat um, in the next minute or two so that you can click on that link and join the Miro boards yourself um, to, to join me here in the Miro environment. And, and when you do, um, for, we're going to split the, the remaining part of the afternoon down into 15 minute sessions. Each session is going to uh, focus on one aspect of the board. So we're going to start with rows and we're then going to move on to uh, spend 15 minutes looking at that. And what we'd like you to do is to take one of the post-it notes in the, in the rows area, um, copy and paste it if you need to create a, a new post-it note, um, and then fill it in with your feedback about what you think is good about ISO 19650. Um, there's an example here already, which I'll just zoom in on to show you, um, to give you an idea of what sort of style we'd like you to, to, to use. So what is it that is, is really useful, X, Y, or Z? Um, we really want to know why. Uh, because when we argue these points in the international community, then it really helps us to have some, um, some evidence and some rationale for the changes that are being made or proposed. Um, and, and so some reason as to why um, something is good is, is helpful. And we've also invited everybody, if they're putting a, um, a suggestion on the post-its, to, if they wish to, to identify yourselves um, in shorthand form um, Dan here uh, made the example, so Dan R, BSI, we can get your contact details from the, uh, from, from the login details to the webinar, so we don't need full email addresses or anything like that um, on these post-its, but just that will enable us to follow up any queries that we have um, after, the, the, after the session finishes. So that is, that's how we're going to, to run the, uh, the Miro session. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, you hopefully you've got the the link in the uh, chat um, uh, in the in the chat window, um, and if everybody can now click that link to to join us in the Miro session, then um, we can start with the first um, with with the first part of the of the afternoon. So. Um, when you've got yourselves into the into the Miro board, um, then please uh, add your comments, add your um, feedback to the post-it notes. At the end of the 15-minute session for Rose, I'll just have a quick read through what we've got and summarise some of the key points that have been made. Um, 
in, in before we move on to the next uh, part of the afternoon and look at uh, the next uh, set of challenges around the, the thorns. So, Rose, suggestions, please, um, off we go. If you're having any challenges with the, the Miro board, then uh, put um, any uh, uh, any 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 um, issues in the uh, in the chat sorting. Okay, this is good. I can start to see some um, some some post-it notes being filled out on the on the Miro screen. Um, so that's helpful. I can see some people are um, starting to also go across into the thorn area um, to identify some some challenges with with 19650 parts one and two. Uh, that that's great, but I'd like to encourage everybody to focus for the moment on the on the rose area to capture your um, your positive feedback uh, first, and then we'll come on to the the thorn area in. Um, in about five minutes time. So we, we will still have plenty of time to look at um, challenges, uh, but it'd be good to get your, your positive thoughts first.
Uh, David, I can see some people are also updating the ones just above uh, your screen as well, which is great, using some of the, the template ones, in case you hadn't spotted that. Uh, right, okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks. Okay, we'll give this another couple of minutes um, and then we will draw a line under under the roses and move across to the, the next part of the of the board. I'm also going to try and move some of the post-its down so that they can be clustered at the bottom of the screen um, into areas where we might have uh, similar ideas being talked about. Um, that's not anything hard and fast, it's just my interpretation of what I'm reading on the, on the post-its. Apologies if I grab something while you are still editing it. I don't mean to uh, to make life more difficult. I think it certainly do. It seems interesting that there's some common themes emerging, which is uh, which is great. Mm, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the text on the post-its does get quite small when you when, when we get all the details in, but we that's that's okay. We need it, and we can zoom in um, as in order to see the the, the individual uh, thoughts that are put there. Okay, right. Um, let me just move some of these things down so that we've got them. I think this one here that I've just got at the moment uh, is, is kind of edging across into the, the thorn area. So um, I'll just put it on the edge of the, uh, of the, of the frame. Um, have we got 
any more being developed in rows? I don't think so. I think that's the lot that, that we've got. So um, just a quick summary of the topics that you have identified here um, on the on the post-its in, in the rows area. Uh, we've got some, some good feedback about the, the fact that 19650 is, is a process-based standard, so it's focusing on, uh, on helping people with what they need to do um, rather than being uh, oriented around technology, for example. Um, and of course, we need both uh, in order to be successful with, with information management. Um, good to see that uh, we've got some support for the improvements over the previous UK standards, good though they were, um, the opportunity to internationalise, I think, has enabled us to think a, li a little more, a lot more clearly about the, the structure of the standards. Um, uh, some comments over here on the left about the, uh, the importance of focusing on uh, information generally rather than just um, uh, tending to, to leading people, encouraging people to think just about um, graphical models uh, and geometrical information. So um, that that's that's was one of the the the, ch the uh, ambitions of the ISO standard. So it's good to see that's worked. Um, and over here on the right, um, some some good feedback about the um, uh, the the fact that it helps assign responsibilities uh, and also. Um, brings all members of the of the team of a team whether it's a project team in the case of part two or a, an asset management team in the case of part three bring gives them clear uh things that they need to be doing and and therefore um uh, it enables there to be uh, less and less misunderstanding of, of who's supposed to be doing what um and finally just this one down the bottom is the fact that it's an international standard is is appreciated because that provides um uh collaboration and, and understanding across the, the wider community so excellent thank you uh, very much for for your contributions in the in the rose area let me zoom out um and of course you can continue to add things to the rose part of the of the Miro board uh, but what I'd like to do is to move across to the um, to the thorn uh, area and um, for some reason I can't see anything that's going on in thorn um, I don't know what's happened there um, ah there we are it's showing up now uh, so what I'd like you to do is to now um, document your uh, areas for improvement in the ISO standards parts one and two. Again, um, trying to be as specific as you can and also to give your reasons um, uh, where, where you can. That would be, that, that's incredibly helpful. Um, so, and, and I suspect uh, you might need rather more post-it notes in this area. Um, we always like to perhaps uh, identify challenges um, more, more easily. They, they come to us more easily than the, the positive feedback. Uh, so just copy and paste an existing uh, post-it note to create a new one and um, fill it in with the, the, the what. What is um, unhelpful or unclear or needs to be improved from your point of view and explain briefly why. Um, and, and that would be great. So we've got, it's now just coming up to two minutes to three, and we're gonna run the, the Thorn session until 10 past. So we've got another 12 minutes to add uh, suggestions to the to the Thorn, Thorn part of the Miro board. Um, if I can just um, ask uh, George at, at BIM for housing, perhaps, that, if that's who that is, um, the, the, the post that you've put up about it not being explicit, um, could you be uh, perhaps uh, give us a little bit more detail about what is not explicit? That would be helpful uh, there on that particular post it. In, um, if, if that's yours, then, then please can you perhaps give us a little bit more hint as to uh, what you think needs to be changed? Thanks.
for the benefit of anybody who is just on the go to webinar and uh, looking at my shared screen um, to see what's happening in in the Miro session then um, I'll try and zoom in at various points into the post-its so you can hopefully read what's being written um, in the Miro session but if you wish to join us and add your own feedback to the session then then please do this really is a case of the more the merrier just having a quick look at some of the um posters that have been added uh, something here about uh, client maturity um, being a, a challenge. Um, that's not necessarily something that the ISO itself can do anything about, uh, but uh, unless it, it's about re, um, rewriting the, the, the client uh, responsibilities in the ISO or the, the appointing party responsibilities. Um, but it can be supported by bodies like NEMA. to see that there are some, uh, some some real pressures from you to move away from um, the language of BIM. Uh, we've been using it for the last goodness knows how many years, but uh, it seems as though we are, or a number of you, are now ready to move on and start talking uh, more generally about information management. Uh, really interesting post-it here in the centre that I've just um, clicked on, which is about uh, uh, the, the the challenge of multiple lead appointed parties and the coordination that needs to be going on between them when they are working concurrently. Um, I think we already acknowledge that's something that's not particularly explicit in the part two standard. Um, so interesting to, that that has been um, picked out there. I think that's something that's definitely going to be, uh, if, if we get to a review, then that's something that's going to be um, in, in our sights to, to make that better. Okay, great. I've just watched this uh, post-it being um, completed. Uh, thank you, Mike, um, with uh, um, noting that, that the, some of the examples in, in the text uh, still seem to be very buildings oriented. Uh, so we can, we can certainly do our best to, uh, to put that right to, um, to make sure that it's more, uh, that there's more infrastructure and uh, broader environmental examples in there as well.
So we've got about another five minutes in this session, um, trying to pick out some of the, the challenges with the existing 19650 standards. So that, that's great. Um, still lots of time to put in some, some more post-its in this, in this area. Uh, thank you, Andy, for um, a, a nice, a really explicit uh, comment here, um, focusing on the task information delivery plan uh, and its relationship uh, or needing to identify the level of information need. Um, it's a good point. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we certainly can, can use um, explicit and, and really focused uh, comments about particular uh, requirements in the standard if, if those are your bugbears as well as maybe some of the broader um, overarching challenges so um, all types of comments in that regard um, from the ISO point of view are, um, are okay. There's been a couple of comments um, about the uh, terms and definitions and, and where those are, are located. Um, that's certainly something that we have seen with the development of the ISO series over a period of time. Um, then uh, we started with an initial vocabulary in 1950 parts, part one, um, and, and that has been added to um, in some of the later parts of the of the ISO series, um, there is clearly an opportunity to rationalise and maybe centralise the vocabulary uh, as much as we can. Uh, I'd need to check with uh, with my my colleagues at, at ISO as to exactly how that might happen. So good 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 for, to raise the point there. Another good uh, detailed comment here, um, which I can see from Bryn about the uh, the client shared uh, state in the common data environment, which is um, touched on in part one as part of the CDE concept, uh, but it isn't actually uh, then elaborated in uh, in part two. So it does seem a little bit like a um, a potential dead end. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the standard. So that, that's something we can certainly also look at. Right, let me just zoom out so I can just get a picture on the overall shape of the, of the board because we're coming to the end of our 15 minutes and it's interesting to see the, the quantity of um, of suggestions that we've had in this uh, in this part of the of the session, um, I'm just going to let it run for another minute or two because I think you might still have some things that you want to say. So um, uh, let me just, uh, it, although we're coming up to uh, time to to move on, I will just uh, let, uh, extend this this part for uh, a, a couple more minutes um, and also start to try and group some of the. Uh, the, the post-its together. Although I think, Dan, you might be doing that already. So um, uh, thank you for your help in that. And That's then right. I will just remind myself what we're doing next. Yeah, I'm happy to do the grouping in the background, David, so you can concentrate on the session. Thank you very much, Dan. That's very helpful. 
and I can see you're even doing some organising in the um, in the rows area. So um, thanks for that too. Right, let's see if we can just group uh, have a look at what we've got in uh, any new things that have come into the the thorn area. Um, I'm just going to zoom in quite a lot so I can read what's on the on the post-its. Um, Uh, interesting point here about overlaps with practices outside of information management um, and it, the examples here are procurement and project management. Um, this is always going to be an area of tension. Um, 19650 is just an information management standard and we have to be very careful about not um, duplicating the, the scope of other existing standards. So um, there, are, there is a limit to what we can, we can do, although um, we, we can obviously we haven't gone quite far enough or we've gone too far, then uh, we, let us know uh, and then we can do what we can to, to improve that. Um, it's interesting, there's a, um, a point here about information requirements only being top down. Um, I think that's quite an important um, aspect that we have learned over the years um, in implementing the ISO, that, that actually information requirements potentially are in all directions. So that, that's something that which um, I think will have a lot of resonance. Um, So a point here about um, enabling implementation of the ISO through um, awareness and upskilling and training, um, which of course is, is absolutely critical. Uh, so a comment there about the, um, the need for a unique identifier. I'm guessing that's in relation to information containers um, Phil put that comment in, but um, that, that's my assumption. If I'm wrong, please can you edit your, uh, your post-it just to clarify uh, if that's not to do with information containers. Um, interesting point, comment here about the, the definition of BIM. Um, given some of the other queries about moving away from BIM to information management, uh, this might be something that solves itself if the term gets uh, removed from, from the ISO. But that might be a step too far for many people. So we might have to think or try and uh, improve the, the definition of, uh, of BIM. Uh, we do whatever we can to make sure it's about broader information and data management, not just 3D. So um, we perhaps haven't got that quite, quite firmly, uh, said, said firmly enough. Um, uh, an issue here about the, the contractual aspects, um, with it being highly prescriptive. Um, okay, yeah, that, that is, um, it is meant to be a, a process standard which, which sets down requirements. So um, maybe a, a, a thought about how it can be implemented into contracts. We need to reflect on that. Okay, right, now then, I think um, I'm going to draw a line under uh, the the thorn area. Uh, we've got lots of ideas here, um, some of which I haven't really dealt uh, tackled before. But let me just focus on this one. Um, this is highlighting that there are some um, different phraseology between parts two and three um, of the standards. So part two for uh, project delivery, part three for um, operation and maintenance. So we have potentially got some, some challenges there about how uh, topics are differently uh, explained in the two standards. We need to try and keep them as close together as possible. Okay, right, so um, thank you for all of those comments. Um, Dan, if I can leave you to do some um, collating and gathering on those um, in the over the next few minutes, um, then what I'd like people to do now is to Shift your attention across to the uh, the third part of the Miro board, and that's the bug 
needs. So what are the opportunities for improvement? Um, where have we got things that we can develop further? Um, how can we how can we improve the the existing nature of the standards in an org in an organic way and an incremental way um, rather than sort of the more dramatic uh, perhaps uh, changes that were being identified in in the thorn section. So um, if you've got some ideas here for the for the green area of of the Miro board, then please um, come to the the bud area and start putting some post its in this part. Um, of the Miro area for um, for things that can be can be chat can be improved. Um, thank you, Nicoletta. I can see you're already starting to uh, to write a, a comment in in that in that part. Um, and interesting that you're focusing on level of information need. Uh, yes, this is a, a topic which has uh, been the subject of quite a lot of discussion and debate since the first ISO standards were published in 2018, um, not least with the, the European standards on level of information need. So something I think we understand a lot better now than we did then. And so I think we can definitely improve the explanation uh, that's in the, in the ISO standards, 19650 standards about level of information need. Thank you, Nicoletta, for, for bringing that to our attention. We're going to finish the whole Miro session at 3.25 to make sure that we are on time to finish the, uh, the whole. Um, so we can hand back to, to Dan in the, uh, in, in the go to meet, in the go to webinar um, by half past, which is our, which is our cutoff time. And he can, he will then take us through the final uh, part of the, of the webinar. Um, so we've got another um, seven or eight minutes um, just to add further ideas to the, the bud section. Um, let me just have a little look at some of the suggestions that are coming in here. Um, I'm just looking at this uh, post-it that's being drafted at the moment on uh, requirements for facilities management um, to develop those in more detail. Um, and although the part two standard is about project delivery, then there is, um, for, for in many cases, a need to incorporate uh, requirements from the facilities or asset management team. So yes, that, that probably needs to be um, made much more explicit in part two, um, so that it ties up more closely with part three. Uh, what have we got up here at the top? Um, something being added about the uh, a, a better defined scope of the information models for their sort of physical and functional characteristics. And I think that's maybe helping people um, understand what, what we mean by information models, as it is a little bit of a, um, it's a bit of an academic uh, phrase. Um, so maybe we need to, yeah, we need to be more explicit in, in what we mean by that. That's great. Um, what else are we getting down here? Uh, yep, yeah, encouraging the use of um, data libraries, which have been through uh, standardization and quality assurance uh, processes. That, that's a really, really helpful um, idea there to, to encourage the, the and that, that I think really is encouraging the tie-in with other uh, aspects of organizational management um, and other things that exist in the standards um, landscape around data dictionaries, around uh, libraries and so forth. Um, we can make much better, I think, cross-reference now to some of these ideas which have been, you know, which were just in development when the ISO 19650 standards were, um, were, being, uh, were being written. So it, in, case, in, in terms of thinking about what's happened over the last 10 years, 
then uh, certainly the land, the standards landscape has uh, become much richer over that period of time. Uh, we have a, a, a plethora of international standards now in this space, um, and I think that should in, enable us to be um, much more helpful in our descriptions and discussions, certainly in the concepts and principles in part one, but hopefully also in uh, bringing some of these ideas more explicitly into uh, part two. Good, good point here about um, encouraging the uh, adoption into into contracts. Um, that, that's is potentially a little bit of a challenge um, in the international community. Um, contracts is always quite a, a touchy uh, subject um, internationally, so we, we might have to be quite um, quite careful how we how we try and um, get get that sort of assistance into the standards, but I can quite understand where the where the desire is coming from. I've also been given permission to um, to overrun by a few minutes. Thank you, Dan. So um, although I said we were going to finish at uh, 3.25, if you're still going strong, then we can certainly take another two or three minutes to make sure we've got all of your uh, suggestions and ideas uh, captured in the Miro board as part of this feedback session. Great uh, comment here from Andy about um, capability and capacity at task team level, uh, making sure that it's not just part of the procurement activities, but it's also um, introduced during the iterative nature of appointments being made down the supply chain within the delivery team. So um, really good there. Oh, I like this idea over in the, um, just underneath the bud heading. Um, is it possible to combine parts two and three into a single document? Uh, that, that, it may be, um, it's certainly something we should, we should um, raise as a question. Uh, I'm be interesting to see how much uh, support there is for that internationally. Um, I think in the UK, we'd certainly see it as a way of simplifying the, the ISO series. Um, because they are so similar, uh, but uh, whether it actually addresses the issue which we touched on this morning about appropriate language for, for different audiences, um, we might need to uh, think very carefully about whether just having a single document covering all parts of the life cycle would still encourage uh, both the project delivery and the asset management communities to engage with this topic so maybe some 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 good questions there um not quite sure how they're going to um how they're going to resolve themselves we'll find out when we start talking to the international into the other members of the international working group Yeah, good to see this idea about um, language and um, terms, uh, whether you call it a glossary or a bibliography or a, 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 uh, and so forth, being, being centralised. Um, I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, we need to be careful that, that on its own that might sound like we're creating a new standard. Um, it may be just we are we're then strengthening the terms and definitions aspects of uh, part one. Uh, great bit of um, feedback here from um, which I've just focused on, which is to 
really make sure we are engaging with the uh, the various bodies that represent um, the different parts of the industry, uh, making sure that we're capturing uh, real life experiences and applications of information management uh, so that we can make the, the standard um, better uh, better reflect what, what the, the different uh, sectors in the industry need. Just see if there's anything down here at the bottom of the window. Uh, no, I can't see anything in the bottom half of the of the bud screen. So um, Just having a quick look at some of the new post-its that are just being added um, in the, the various parts of, of this, this area of the Miro. Um, something there about pre-qualification um, in, in part two. So that, that's an, an, an area that, that we haven't really addressed at the moment. Um, Some topics here about um, making making it more explicit how uh, better information leads to to better outcomes, uh, particularly with issues around safety. Yep, really important there. Um, another uh, um, suggestion here about I think I think really making a stronger case for information management. Um, this, this sounds to me like um, material for the, the part one uh, standard uh, of the series to, to talk about the, the, the business case. Uh, that's certainly something we've addressed or tried to address in the guidance um, and with, through NEMA. Um, but again, now we've got a bit more experience, then we can, uh, we can deal with that, uh, hopefully at the ISO, in the ISO itself. Okay, now I, I don't know if there are any any oh yes, there's a couple of post-its still being um, uh, being created. Um, so some interesting comments here about um, the idea of a digital execution plan, um, and uh, yeah, capability at the um, in pre-qualification. Okay, so thank you very much. What I am gonna do is uh, I'm gonna slowly draw this session to a close. Um, I'm gonna zoom out so that we can see the, um, the extent of the, of the material that's been added in the, uh, in the bud area of the Miro board. So you know, a lot of really helpful uh, ideas and, and bits of feedback there. If I can just go back to um, the thorn area where Dan has been doing some um, some grouping then if I can just zoom in ever so slightly and just uh, quickly uh, look at the the headings that Dan has sort of grouped the um, the, the ideas into then um, going from the top we've got some suggestions around the task information delivery plan the common data environment quite a lot of suggestions about uh, terms and definitions and also some some suggestions about improving information requirements um, as tends to happen when we get asked for feedback then we do sometimes get diametrically opposite views uh, so we've got some um, some thoughts here about there being some lack of prescription uh, and also that there's too much prescription. Well, um, I, I don't think we're going to be able to satisfy both of those simultaneously um, unless there are some really um, precise points that are going to come out of those ideas. Um, it might be helpful for those of you who've put those ideas in to just identify yourselves, if you don't mind, so that we can perhaps follow up with what you're, what you're driving at there. Um, some ideas about multiple lead-appointed parties um, and, um, and consistency. So that's helpful to see. And um, I'm just going to zoom in on this little set of suggestions on bias and focus. So um, oh, that's about um, thinking, making sure that we are being suitably um, generic in our 
um, in, in our explanations and our examples. So that has all been, that's really amazing. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, putting all of those uh, ideas into the, um, into the Miro board. Um, I'm going to close the session now and I'm going to ask uh, BSI to take back control of the screen and to now go back to sharing the, the slides um, uh, or the, 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 the GoToWebinar screen and ask Anna to um, just give us a few um, next steps uh, from this feedback session. Thank you, David. And um, on behalf of David, Dan and myself, I'd like to thank everybody who's contributed today. So your thoughts and suggestions. Um, it looks like there have been some really valuable points that have been raised and it looks like there are also some common themes that are coming through as a result of that uh, session. Also, um, the mirror board will remain open until the end of the day if anybody does want to go back and add anything that they think of later or if they want to expand on their comments. Um, so, so please do feel free to go back until the end of today. As regards next steps, um, we, that is BSI and B555, are going to collate all the comments that we've received through the various feedback initiatives that are taking place. Uh, they will then be reviewed, we'll look to identify some common themes and basically consolidate the UK's position to feedback to ISO when the systematic review opens later in the year. So thank you all once again and I will hand back to Dan for his closing remarks. Brilliant, thank you very much Anna and I'd also like to echo um, our thanks from everyone to yourself and David for running that session. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who has participated and continues to participate. Uh, what I'll do is I'll do a quick wrap up. So you two are welcome to escape if you want now. So thank you for your hard work. Um, and I have the unenviable task of trying to summarize all of the information that is has come through today. And, you know, just looking at my scribbles and some of the things I can see there, I think it's been very interesting to hear of that sort of uh, Christmas Carol-esque past, present, future structure in where we've looked at things. Uh, particularly when you think about how Fergus began talking about how you know, the, the advent of CAD was back in the 1950s. And given the prevalence of it still in many different areas, I think that you know, it just shows how long it can take for technology once it becomes so kind of permeated in what we do to have any sort of disruption or shift in it. But you know, from there, we've seen massive development as when we got into the 2000s, where we did a lot of the research for it, and then into the, the teens, if I'm allowed to call them that, uh, where we first saw things like BIM Level 2 and the transition from our PASs up to the ISO standards. So all that acceleration there, where, as Fergus mentioned, you know, there were improvements around productivity, uh, other outcomes relating to things like safety, um, as well as being able to do more international trade and have that international focus on or what we are doing, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, some of you have seen it. There's a lot of hard work our, the international teams do do on promoting people like uh, Adam Matthews and stuff who have gone out, uh, which has meant all places like Latin America and others have started to look at the UK approach and are looking to adopt it. Um, Going forward then into things like the 2020s, um, we saw Anne give an overview of all the different work that's happening uh, throughout NEMA and the areas that NEMA is, is touching into as well, showing that very much information management and the activities around it and BIM are more alive than ever. And we're seeing how it's actually starting to spill into other areas like sustainability and that relationship with zero like with fire safety and racing people like the Building Safety Alliance. So there's very much a, a network being created of people who are keen and interested in good practice information management, because regardless of what you're looking at, to, to achieve outcomes and realize them, information is important. I thought there's a very poignant point from Fergus in the discussion chat around this idea that actually in the future, my information about the asset be more important than the asset itself, which I thought was quite powerful. Uh, and we can see this idea then that you know, going forwards, we had our predictions. Um, hopefully we'll be correct, we'll see, but we're certainly uh, future focused and aspirational in that the future generation 
um, might help solve things and areas like procurement and others are key focuses going forwards. And ultimately with your feedback, which has been you know, incredibly powerful and we will continue to try and collate and pull these together. As Anna mentioned, you know, we haven't done this task just to see what's happening. We are going to take the, this insight, we're going to run with it and it's going to help form the UK's national view as we look at what's going to happen to 19650 going forwards. And we're also going to collate it with other feedback sessions that NEMA and others have run to ensure that we get as wide a view as possible. So if you see other sessions being advertised, yeah, feel free to attend those and provide your feedback there as well as we're all talking to each other and we're going to collect and make sure that we get as many responses as we can from a, a broader stakeholder group as possible. And with that, I will probably just say thank you all very much for attending. I hope you found the session insightful in the morning and I will certainly find your feedback incredibly insightful as I go through it in more detail uh, afterwards. So I think all that leads me to do is to start to wrap up. Uh, so hopefully this isn't the first one of these BSI webinars you've attended and we have a plethora of other topics and subjects that are being looked at. For example, uh, you know, we have uh, effectively after the summer uh, a range of things that range from fire testing, construction products, uh, retrofit into updates around past 2030, 2035. Uh, and others going on, as well as, as always, our end of year conference, the Global Build Environment Conference, which will be happening then uh, in December. But you can always have a look at what's happening at knowledge.bsigroup.com. And these, as always, are, are virtual events uh, free to attend, and a number of them we are doing in partnership, as you can see there, with the IFE. Uh, so if you have any ideas and topics you think you might want us to talk about, either in our lunchtime webinars or in more substantial events like this, please do let us know. And I think that takes me more or less to the end, I think. Um, I don't think there's an extra slide afterwards. So what I'll do is I will leave it there, say thank you very much for attending. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the session. Feel free to drop into the Miro for the rest of the day until we lock it off and collect comments. And hope you have a enjoyable rest of your afternoons. Thank you. <laughs>